I'm Diane Flaherty. I'm the chair of the economics department, and I want to welcome you all. I see a lot of Val Voorhees students here today. I'm glad you could come. Um, this is our 12th annual Gamble Lecture, and you should know that it is a series that has been funded by the family of Philip Ragosa, uh, Isu Ragosa, who was an alum of UMass, and when he was here, his professor was Philip Gamble who was also a longtime chair of the economics department. So this Gambo series comes from the Ragosa family in honor of Professor uh, Gamble, who was the chair. And just a logistical announcement, at the end here, we're going to have a nice reception downstairs in the atrium on the ground floor. So please join us for good food, and we hope good conversation after the lecture and the question and answer session are over. We're very proud today to have Professor Ferber as our speaker. And Janet Rifkin, our dean, will introduce, just sit there for a second, I something nice about you first. <laughs> <laughs> Janet will introduce Professor Ferber, but I want to say a few words about, professor, about Dean Rifkin first. She'll be embarrassed about this, okay? So, no, 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 no I have to say it. Because I want to tell you about your college and your dean. She's the most visionary and effective dean that we've had since I've been at UMass, which is more years than I'd like to admit. But the main thing about her that you should know, and so many of you are students, it's important, she is a powerful advocate for students. She takes students to lunch, free lunches. No dean has ever done that before. I'm leaving. <laughs> so we really appreciate that about our dean, that she's taking seriously the charge that this is a place that does good undergraduate education. I want to thank her for that. Unfortunately, it's the last time I can thank her at this event because she's leaving at the end of the year as dean. So, with respect and affection, but sadness because you're leaving, Dean Rifkin. Thank you very much. Uh, food is a most effective form of advocacy, okay, <laughs> if any of you want to learn anything. But it's my thank you very much for those kind words, two kind words. But today, I'm not here to talk about me. I'm here because I've had the honor to introduce our guest speaker, Marianne Ferber. And your talk, I think, tell me if I'm right, is going to be called Confessions of a Late Starter. Did I get that right? That's good. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a professor emerita of economics and women's studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She was born in Czechoslovakia in 1923. She emigrated to Canada in 1938, obtained her, her BA degree at McMaster University and her PhD at the University of Chicago. She was a visiting scholar at Stanford University in 1984, visiting professor at Radcliffe from 1993 to 1995. She's also the co-author of The Economics of Women, Men, and Work, co-editor of Beyond Economic Man, its sequel, Feminist Economics Today, Feminist Economics Today, excuse me, co-editor of Work and Family, Policies for a Changing Workforce, and author or co-author of numerous other publications. She has been active in American Economic Association's Committee on the Status of Women in the Economic Profession. She was a founding member and second president of the International Association for Feminist Economics and President of the Midwest Economics Association. It is my honor to welcome you, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say, and I'll tell you afterwards whether I should have said less. <laughs> saying this, but I will say it. It was very wise to choose someone to introduce me who is leaving town before too long. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very happy to be here. I have some very dear personal friends here, uh, of the ones who were able to be in town, particularly Lisa Saunders and Nancy Fogre, but perhaps I shouldn't have said that until the end either. Uh, my original title was Confessions of a Late Starter, and I'm going with that still, but I added to that, and a long distance runner. <laughs> <laughs> Since you were told when I was born, if your arithmetic is as good as mine, and that's about as far as my math goes, you can figure out how old I am. Uh, and now I will start with my more or less formal talk. The motto of my life has long been better late than never. Although I started at the very beginning by coming somewhat early, this will give you sort of some idea of my background as a child. 
Uh, my parents were then living in a little village called Yeshkov. And unless they somebody here from Czechoslovakia who couldn't possibly pronounce that. Uh, and uh, my mother expected to give birth at home, as everyone did in those days. And the arrangement that the family, a brother of my father's lived in another nearby village, and they were expecting a child in December. And she had duly arrived, and I was supposed to arrive in February. But as it turned out, I came in January, and my uncle had to take the midwife who was still helping my aunt through snow, through a real snowstorm with a horse and sleigh to the little village so that I could duly arrive. But, and for a time, I did things in a fairly timely progression. My older sister and I, uh, as most of my relatives, and there was a whole clan of us living in the, what is now the Czech Republic, uh, went to German schools. And uh, we went to a German grade school, but by the time I was about to finish, things were becoming fairly uncomfortable among the Sudeten Germans, as they were called. Uh, there were people just like any other people, but during that period, they became very enthusiastic, the vast majority of them, about Hitler. And they became what in the Sudetenland, as it was called, uh, were called Henleins, but they were Nazi. Henlein was their local leader. And they did this at a time when it was not dangerous not to do it. They were just conformists, as I find most people in any country I know anything about are. And I acquired a congenital dislike of conformity. <laughs> I made up my mind that as much harm is done by people of goodwill not speaking up because they don't want to be different, as by people who are of goodwill to begin with, who are usually in the minority in most places. Now, some people don't take this very well and keep telling me that I should learn to keep my mouth shut. My mother mentioned that frequently, <laughs> but I'm afraid she did not succeed in this respect. Well, <clears throat> under the circumstances, my parents decided that we should go to a Czech gymnasium, as these institutions are called in many European countries. Uh, there was a system where you went five years to grade school, and then you went either to a four-year school, which was essentially a non-academic track, or you went to a gymnasium, which was eight years. And I got as far as the fifth year, and incidentally felt very comfortable in the Czech school. It was a very decent country. My sister was in literature once wrote an essay, Paradise Lost, and this is how most of us feel about having left there. It really was a great place to grow up. Makes me realize that it's kind of nice being in a small country where people don't feel compelled to be number one, as the <laughs> former president used to say frequently. For those of you who are not old enough, Richard Nixon was always talking about number one. Well, <coughs> uh, after the Austrian Anschluss, which was in the spring of 1938, my mother, who was not only a conformist, but a chronic pessimist, kept saying, we are next. And my father was impressed enough that he and a good friend of his decided to go on a scouting expedition, where one could go in case the need should arise. And they went to uh, France, the United States, and Canada. And although my father particularly liked France, he was very fond of food. Uh, the rest of the group decided there was a group of about 10 families uh, that were going to go together. And they decided, if we are going to leave, let's get out of Europe. Very wise decision by hindsight. So he applied for Canadian visa because he had found out that Canada admitted farmers quota free. Most of you were not alive then, but take my word for it, almost no countries admitted refugees. Sounds familiar, does it? Uh, 
the world hasn't learned much, I think. Uh, but uh, they were a little suspicious, even though, as I always say, yes, Virginia, there were Jewish farmers in Central and Eastern Europe. <laughs> uh, a lot of people to this day are totally unaware of this and are very startled when I tell them that my family were mostly farmers. Uh, the Canadian Pacific, actually, who handled immigration, I don't know how many of you know that in this country the railroad companies were very active in immigration too because they made their money by then ferrying the people from the East Coast to wherever they settled. So they sent two people over to look at the farm that my father had and they were duly impressed that we all had visa. But when the Munich Agreement was signed, it was 70 years ago in September. So it's quite a while ago. Uh, the big question was how to get out. As you may know, uh, even Czechoslovakia, let alone the Czech Republic, are landlocked countries. And you couldn't very well go through Germany because they would have considered us Germans. Well, for this purpose, <laughs> uh, And going the other way, some people did. There were actually people who went east to Russia, and there were colonies in, for instance, Shanghai was a place where a fair number of people survived. There were a few places that admitted refugees. Um, <clears throat> but that was pretty inconvenient way to get to Canada. So he managed to get tickets for the 42 people who were involved each day a few of them because there was only one flight a day and he could go either to Brussels or to Amsterdam. Those were the two direct flights where you didn't have to stop in Germany. And we managed to get tickets to Brussels, stayed there for a week until the group assembled, then went to Antwerp. And incidentally, I should tell you that for the first time in my life, I saw um, African origin. They were probably really African because being in Belgium at the time, there was a ship coming in from the Belgian Congo as it was at the time. And we were just so impressed. They looked so beautiful. The white people looked awfully washed out. Watch sometimes Obama and uh, McCain and he looks like a washed out. <laughs> so would I incidentally. Let me not just stop on McCain though I ordinarily like to do that. Um, well, anyway, after a few days, we thought we might as well, there were a few teenagers in the group, and we thought we might as well make the best of it and see what there was to see. I also saw my first escalator. We went down under the shelter. That's the big river there. You could go up and down as often as you wanted without paying, so we took full advantage of that. But then we went on, took a boat across the channel, were all seasick like dogs. It was by then, uh, I guess, the very end of October. Went to a, a port on the east side of England, took the train to Liverpool, and then a little old boat, which was later sunk during World War II, to Montreal, and the train to Hamilton, Ontario, which for the many of you who probably never heard of it, is the fifth biggest city in Canada. And after staying there for a short time, my father managed to uh, buy a farm with the money of an insurance guy in the Czech Republic who didn't have any way to get out. So my father made a deal. He, he had some money in Switzerland and he bought a farm and hired my father as the manager. And in return, my father promised that he would somehow get him a visa to Canada. And this actually did happen. And so he was the farm manager there. And when we moved there, a couple of weeks after we came, the decision had to be made what to do about my sister and me. She was older and brighter and less practical. So she was going to go right back to school. And a very kind Canadian Jewish family took her in so she could live there while she went to high school because you couldn't commute from the farm, it was much too far. And she did very well. And the next year, 
being helped by another Canadian family who were Protestants, um, she managed to go to the college there, uh, namely McMaster, and did extremely well. And this is relevant, as you will see presently. Uh, I worked on the farm, mainly looking after the chickens, but also helping with milking the cows and this sort of thing. And after a year, my parents decided they were doing a little bit better and I should... No, after a year, I took a job in the city first for a year and did a job which you can do adequately without speaking English, stuffing advertising into envelopes. Everybody should have a job like that for a year because it makes you appreciate anything you get to do afterwards. It's so desperately boring. I came in and watched the clock from the moment I came in. Uh, but after a year of that, my parents decided I should finish high school. And so I went to see the principal in the high school near where I had the farm. And Canada had five years of high school. And he realized that the Czech schools were very good. They still are, incidentally. And so he wasn't sure whether to admit me to the fourth year or the fifth year, even though I was short three years of graduating high school. And so he decided I should go to McMaster and speak to the registrar there, and whatever advice he would give me, he would go along. So I went to see the registrar, and he asked me if I was Wilhelmina's sister or her cousin, and I knew enough English to say I was his sister. And then he said, did I have as much schooling in Europe as she did? I said, no, I had one year less. And he didn't seem particularly interested that she graduated from a Canadian high school, and I did not. So he thought for a minute and said, we'll try the experiment. What would you like to major in? <laughs> well, I was quite astonished, but for once, handled it fairly well. I asked for a catalog as a stall. I came from a totally non-academic background, you understand? And I looked for something that no one took in high school so that I would start out even. <laughs> and in those days, they didn't have many of those esoteric kinds of courses. And anyway, economics comes in the alphabet before sociology. <laughs> <laughs> so I came across economics. And I announced that I would major in economics. And when I came home, my parents were quite astonished that I was going to college rather than high school. And then they asked what I would major in. <laughs> and I said, economics. And they said, what's that? <laughs> and I said, I would let them know just as soon as I finished. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, I'm telling you these things because I get so annoyed when people who made it in the world make it sound as though this were all their own particular merit. <laughs> it's a whole lot of luck that goes into this sort of thing. And I was very, very lucky. I had parents who were fully supportive of my going to college, even though there were lots of relatives who said, oh, those girls, they have their noses in the books, and they'll never get married, which should have been the ambition of any nice girl, especially a nice Jewish girl. And, you know, all this sort of thing, there's just a lot of luck involved. And the fact that this man was willing to take a chance on me was just incredible. Well, so I started out in economics. Now, McMaster was then a very small college. It's become a much bigger place now. And I find it slightly less congenial. It's become more like other universities, like the University of Illinois, where the professional schools are the really important thing and so forth. But anyway, uh, I, in my year, there were four economics majors. You know, this was a time when a woman in economics was rare as hen's teeth. And for those of you who don't come from a farm, I will give you the information that hen don't have any teeth. <laughs> uh, but the fact that there were three guys and me didn't seem particularly exciting. I didn't realize what the real world was like. So, and I worked very hard, and things were going pretty well. 
And when I was a junior, a young man, who in the end never did get his degree, but who was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, came to teach for a year because he was running out of money. He did to replenish his fortune. And late in the academic year, he called me in and asked if I had thought about going to graduate school, which I had not. But he made it sound sort of interesting, and I didn't have any other plans in mind. I certainly didn't intend to get married. And so I thought this was fine. And I said, OK, where should I apply? And I remember his exact answer. In economics, there are only two places, Harvard and Chicago. <laughs> I said, fine. I thought if you didn't flunk out, you could go to any school of your choice. I only found out years later that wasn't true. My problem was I needed some financial aid. So I applied to both places for a uh, service scholarship. And I remember the day when both letters arrived on the same day and were in my mailbox. And I stood there for quite a while being afraid to open them, but finally I did. It turned out. I got a pretty equivalent offer from both places. However, in the process of applying, I found out that Harvard wasn't really co-educational. I would have taken classes with the guys, but I would not have gotten a Harvard degree, I would have gotten a Radcliffe degree. And furthermore, there were some libraries I couldn't use. And I thought this was patently absurd, and applied and decided to go to Chicago. Ironically, at the end of my career, when I was official retirement age at the University of Illinois in 1993, I was invited to come to Radcliffe. They just started the Public Policy Institute, and so I ended up there, even though I didn't start out there, and I took a certain amount of pleasure. You know, they are a bit arrogant there. <laughs> You've heard about the president, probably. Not the present president, I mean her predecessor. Uh, uh, I, under the circumstances, decided I would go to Chicago. But later, you see, I took a certain amount of pleasure in telling them that I once turned them down for graduate work, which they didn't hear all that often. So. Chicago has since then acquired a well-earned reputation for being the Chicago school. And I want you to know when I was there, it was very different. I was there, as I tell people, and I have mentioned this to some of you whom I already met, I was there BF, before Friedman. <laughs> <laughs> and the school was very different. One of my very first appointments, and I don't recall why I was told to go and see this particular professor, but there was Oscar Lange from Poland, who incidentally wrote a magnificent little book, which is still worth reading, about market socialism. <coughs> socialism, it, it, you can be a socialist without being an ardent Stalin supporter, take my word for it. Uh, and I met him. And I met the graduate assistant who was sitting there doing something or other for him. That graduate assistant was Leonid Hurwicz. Does the name click? He got the Nobel in economics last year. And unlike most of the Chicago type Nobel Prize winners, what he really got the Nobel Prize for, that's how it was written up, was for trying to learn more about when the market works and when it does not work. That's a sensible research area instead of just assuming that the market is perfect. Of course, the last few weeks, even the ardent Friedmanites have apparently discovered that there are times when you need the government if you keep up with the news at all. You presumably know what I'm talking about. But not only was it these two people? There was the whole Coase Commission, as it was then called, later called the Coase Foundation after they moved to Yale. And that was very nearly the time when I left. 
that they also won't neglect, or maybe about a year later. Uh, I have never been able to establish with any certainty to what degree they were pushed by Chicago and to what degree they were pulled, but there were people who were definitely not neocons, as they are now called. So Chicago really changed. And my senior professor, whom I particularly admired, he was a brilliant lecturer. I used to look forward to his lectures the way you look forward to a virtuoso concert or whatever type of music you enjoy. Uh, and he was left for the Advanced Institute at Princeton. And I was told that uh, I should ask him for a recommendation uh, before he leaves. And so I did that, and he said something in the letter which the department had, who was one of the lesser whites, thought I would be so pleased to hear that he told me, which he wasn't supposed to, of course. He apparently said I was the best woman student he ever had. Well, I was furious. <laughs> in those days, it was entirely possible that I was the only woman student. <laughs> <laughs> and when much later I read a book by two sociologists who said about women in academia, though it's a book written some years ago, things have improved since then. After all, I was introduced today by the chair, of, woman chair of the department and a woman dean. I mean, that could not have happened in those days. Uh, but <coughs> uh, the Things really were pretty uh, peculiar. As a matter of fact, one thing I meant to mention before I got to the end of my Chicago, or the end of my uh, time in Chicago, uh, in the second year there, I got a pretty nice fellowship. Uh, only one person received a greater fellowship, and that was Don Patinka, we may have heard of, and I had no qualms about the fact that he deserved a better fellowship than I did. But the next day I bumped into one of my professors, uh, one of the lesser lights, I might say, and he stopped me and congratulated me and told me that he voted against it. And I wasn't so surprised that he did, even though I had gotten A's in his classes, but I was amazed that he chose to tell me and by hindsight, I think he just had to get it off his chest. He said to me, I don't see why we should spend money on a woman who will only go out and have babies. So, <laughs> I, for once, I was truly speechless. <laughs> uh, but it turned out that this was a very salutary event. Because as things progressed, and with the big change that had taken in the department, I was left with people on my dissertation committee who I had never met and with whom I had almost nothing in common. We disagreed in terms of value judgments on just about anything I can think of. And I had a pretty miserable time, in addition to which Chicago was and perhaps continues to be famous for not treating graduate students. They thought nothing of taking a year to read a draft. So there were times when I was really tempted to chuck it. And then I, every time I was tempted, I said to myself, no, I'm not going to prove that guy right. So it turned out to be a good thing. Other than that, I have very fond memories of Chicago. My fellow graduate students, many of them were good friends. And one of them, I ended up marrying. He didn't intend to get married either, so he came as a great surprise to our friends on both sides. But it worked out extremely well. He was an economist, and uh, his uh, original major was actually labor economics, but he later got into more statistical work and particularly survey work. And for the last 15 years of his life, and he died in 1981, which is a long time ago. Uh, he was the first director of the Survey Research Laboratory at Illinois. And 
he had been at Chicago two years before I was and was finished a year before I even took my prelim. So we decided that I would stay on in Chicago until I finished my prelims and then I would get married get in New York and stay on there. And I tried very hard to get a teaching job in New York, but without a PhD or even much progress on my dissertation, I didn't succeed. So I took the research job that was offered to me. I also tried the Fed, and the Fed seemed to be pretty interested, but they would have had to wait about six months to get special permission because I wasn't an American citizen. And I needed some income <laughs> right away, pretty much. So uh, I took the job I was offered, and I'm mildly embarrassed to tell you who it was with, what was then called Standard Oil, New Jersey. And uh, in any case, the work I did was OK. But then I was also offered a teaching job at night at Hunter. And I jumped at the chance because I really wanted to find out if I liked teaching and if I could manage to do a decent job. So I was pretty well occupied and that slowed down my dissertation, but I did get some work done. I mean, meantime, my husband, who was from New York, uh, and wanted to give it a try because his parents so much wanted him to live there. He was an only child, but he hated it. So he started job hunting and took the job at the University of Illinois. And as things turned out, we moved there in November. And in December, our first child was born. So I wasn't job hunting right then. But now comes my big story about the University of Illinois episode. Uh, they had brought in the relatively new president of the university brought in one of his friends as dean of the business school, uh, which is where the economics department was until a few years ago. And that dean was a really bright, interesting, enterprising, relatively young man. And he built up the department like you wouldn't believe. He brought in for instance, Leo Hurwicz, whom I already mentioned, or Leonid Hurwicz, depending on how you want to pronounce his name, also brought in Franco Modigliani, Edward Hagen, you know, people of that. These are the biggest names, but he brought in also a bunch of very promising young people. And two women full professors, totally unheard of. Those of you who are interested particularly in home economics, would uh, know the name of one of them, namely Margaret Reed. She genuinely did much of the work that Becker afterwards discovered on home economics, except she didn't have some of his weirder ideas. But anyway, <laughs> um, and the other one was Dorothy Grady. However, the old guard just couldn't tolerate this sort of thing. And two years later, the dean was out. And after that, the way I usually put it, but it's not just a flippant comment, they wouldn't hire women or Jews or foreigners. So unfortunately, I was out of luck. I had always assumed <laughs> that after a year or two, I would get a job. As always, was, there was no chance. So. I didn't totally waste my time. I finished the dissertation. And incidentally, when I came up to Chicago to take my oral, uh, I was warned by Margaret Reed, who was then a faculty member there, who was very nice. She came and took me for lunch and almost literally held my hand before the oral and so forth, and offered not to come because she said there would be lots of other people there. And I said, why? You know, normally your dissertation committee comes. Well, she said, as far as she knew, I was the first woman to come up in the last 10 years. And they were all curious. So a whole bunch of people showed up. And the first thing one of them said to me, are you related to Bob Ferber? 
And I didn't know whether to admit it or not because I didn't want it to reflect badly on him if I won. But anyway, they duly quizzed me and then sent me out. And I was sitting there, you know, biting my nails more than I usually do. And I heard them laugh inside. I still wonder what they thought was so funny. <laughs> And then finally, one man who was new there and who was a very decent guy came out and as he was passing the chair and I said, he meant like this. Then I felt a little better. Well, in due course, they came out and said I made it. But as luck would have it, by then my second child was ready to start nursery school and the econ department was in desperate need for someone to teach the big introductory courses uh, which were so big at that time because there were so many GIs coming back on the GI Bill. Those were the good old days when the people who were sent out to be shot or shoot other people, I think either one is intolerable. When they do come back, they don't, we have no GI Bill now. Think about that sometime. But in those days they did. And so in desperation, they hired me as a visiting lecturer, first a semester at a time, then after some years, a year at a time. It was very convenient for them. They always brought my salary up to the level of the incoming assistant professors. And while everybody else taught two courses, and usually the same ones over and over, I taught three courses, and I was the official pinch hitter. I taught pretty nearly everything except econometrics. Uh, and I was a visiting lecturer for 15 years. My husband always said it was kind of a long visit. <laughs> <laughs> and then in a fit of guilty conscience or whatever, they suddenly offered me an assistant professorship with tenure. But I had really not done any research during this period. And that I have to blame myself for in part, though the fact was that my experience with my dissertation certainly was not conducive to any confidence that I would be able to do research. But then just at that time, a friend of mine who was chair of the local AADP asked if I might be interested in doing some research on how women faculty were doing on our campus. And I thought that sounded interesting, and I scouted around for somebody to do the statistics. And I found a woman who was in the College of Education, who was a well-trained statistician, and we decided to work on this. And because she was capable of it, you know, she did all the things you should do, like right? we collected data, which was a lot of work, but then she used regressions and so forth. And at that time, <coughs> there had been a few academic women who had done some research on this subject, but they were almost entirely from liberal arts. And they counted noses and looked at the salaries. And of course, that doesn't really produce very convincing evidence. Well, we reported our results to the local AEP chapter. And I never found out who, but someone sent out a report to a very well-known sociologist, Alice Rossi, who was then working on her book, Academic Women on the Moon, which was a pretty pioneering work. And she asked us for permission to use our report as one of her chapters. And if you wanted me to finish this talk now, I would simply say, after that, the appetite came with the eating. I thought this was kind of a nice thing to do. And I worked with Jane and later with various other collaborators. And I really desperately need collaborators because I always need someone to do the statistical work. But I find it has many other advantages because I feel I just can't move off and not work hard on this because I would be letting them down. And besides, I enjoy talking things over with people and so forth. I find collaboration is a very nice thing. And at, my, at the very end of this, I'll come back a little bit to collaboration about some other possible advantages. So that was how I first got into research. 
and after that, things went pretty well, although the department has never reached anything like the level during that previous period of glory, and I'm sorry to say that since then, on average, every two or three years, they've had another fight. They always find something to fight about, and since I retired, I just don't pay attention to this one. That's one of the benefits of reaching my age. <laughs> now, a little bit about the second part of the paper, which I now call the report of the long distance runner. And the thing here is that I really think in a strange way I've become a good role model for a good many women. For one reason or another, there's a fair number of women who really don't get started until quite late. And I have met women even in their 40s or late 30s who think it's too late. They just missed the boat. And you can see their eyes light up when I tell them my story. I didn't publish till I was about 50. Now, uh, you know, that clearly shows that you can still have an academic career of sorts. Regrettably, I will never win the Nobel, but then I never thought I'd get nearly as far as I did. So you know how you feel about how what you accomplished is, has very little to do with what you accomplished. It has a lot to do with what you expected to accomplish. Anyway, my first interest at the time uh, evolved directly out of my first project, namely about academic women. But then I gradually extended it from there to women students. I did one paper on attitudes of men and women students toward men and women faculty. And some of the results just turned out to be exactly what you would anticipate. So I don't even have to tell you. Women prefer women and men prefer men. Uh, I also found that among graduate students, one of the best predictors of their success was if they got to know a faculty member of their own sex well. They all saw women on campus sometimes, but very few had the opportunity to get to know them more. Uh, but then I branched out uh, in a variety of ways, and one of the big events in my life was <coughs> when the women economists began to feel that they need an organization of their own. Now, by then, the American Economic Association had established the Committee on the Status of Women in the Economics Profession. And I think it's been a very good and very useful outfit. I was a member of it for a time and thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I still think they have a very useful function. But they can't quite do everything because that one would like to do because they are an official branch of the American Economic Association. So there were a few women who had the brilliant idea that what we needed is the equivalent to a room of our own, right? And so we started the International Association for Feminist Economics. And incidentally, I'm happy to say it turned out to be nearly international. And after a few years, we even decided that we should meet once in the United States and twice elsewhere. That's worked out very well, even though your traveling expenses tend to be a little high. But um, before even, or maybe very shortly thereafter, when the organization was started, uh, there was a meeting at the uh, Allied Social Sciences Association, as the meetings are called because there are other associations in the American Economic Association that meet. <clears throat> they had arranged a meeting on feminist economics. And like the guy who was once asked about prose and hadn't realized that all his life he had been speaking prose, I really wasn't particularly aware that I was a feminist. I didn't know the term. And a young woman calls me up her name turned out to be Julie Nelson. And she asked me if I would be willing to chair a session on feminist economics. And I said, Julie, I don't know anything about that. 
And she persuaded me that you didn't have to know much of anything to chair a session, <laughs> which some of you may have noticed by now. And so I said, okay. And the session ended up being very well attended. And I thought it was in significant part because one of the speakers, who you will have heard of, either under his name or under her name, uh, Donald, lately Deirdre McCloskey. And he, she have always been fairly controversial. I will divulge that I recently reviewed her book called um, Bourgeois Virtues. And if there is one kind remark in there, I made it by mistake. I, I thought it was a dreadful book. <laughs> The Dutch journal that invited me to do this cheerfully told me that it was pretty harsh, but they would be happy to publish it because they're also publishing a review on the other side. I'm dying to see the other review. I haven't seen it yet. Um, so anyway, the session was very successful, and Julie and I went out afterwards with a young man that she had known from graduate school and maybe undergraduate school who was then working for a British publisher, and I can't remember whether it was Routledge or whether it was Elgar, but one or the other. And he suggested that this subject would make a nice book. And Julie asked me if I would work on, with her on that book. And I again said, Julie, I don't know anything about this stuff. And so she persuaded me that I could make some contribution. And in the end, I did. Uh, I was able to get uh, Bob Solo from MIT and uh, Becky Blank, who I think was already at Michigan, who are very well known names among neoclassical economists, to write a commentary that was on, not from the inside, but was admittedly fairly sympathetic. And uh, I was able to help somewhat with a few other things, though I still think Julie deserves much the main credit. And the book was called Beyond Economic Man. And when I came to the economics meetings and went to the University of Chicago book stall <coughs> above them, there was in a semicircle arrangement of photographs of all the Nobel Prize winners from economics, which were already quite a number of them. And right in the middle underneath, there was Beyond Economic Man. <laughs> <laughs> and my reaction was the same as yours. I just stood there and laughed. People must have thought I was nuts. Uh, and I went up and I said, did a woman make that arrangement? <laughs> So anyway, it has since then even had a second edition, and uh, given some of the stuff that that press publishes, I wonder how they can write the laudatory comments that they always do with a straight face on both sides. Uh, so uh, I have continued to do research, and as I say, I have brought it out somewhat, and most recently, <coughs> Uh, I will very briefly tell you about uh, three things that I have been working on and I'm still working on to an extent. One is on Social Security, which I think will continue to be a fairly hot topic. And it is just amazing to me how many people have written on this who should know better, who say Social Security is bound to be in trouble because the proportion of older people to younger people who are of working age has been increasing. Furthermore, I'll go so far as to divulge the information that I hope it will continue to increase. At my age, I'd better hope that. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is that up to a point, this is not a relevant piece of information. The relevant piece of information is how many people pay into the system as compared to how many people are getting money out of the system. It used to be in the quote, so-called good old days, 
that there were almost no women in the labor force. And as we do know, or at least should know, a married woman who has never been in the labor force, while her husband is alive, gets half of what he gets. And if he dies first, and regrettably that is generally the case, she gets as much as he got when he was alive, without ever having paid one penny extra. Now, as more and more women go into the labor force, the proportion of these people obviously goes down. That is totally overlooked. Secondly, one of the other things people mentioned, it used to be that it was three or four or five children who paid in, and they had only <coughs> one set of parents to support among all of them. Yeah, but they were also raising a whole bunch of children. Now, the people who cry about having to support their older parents, and they may only have one sibling or so to help them, they may have one or two measly children. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them are not so measly. <laughs> uh, these things are totally overlooked. And in addition to that, when you read up on the countries which initially publicized heavily that they had privatized, Chile was the first one to start under the renowned and happily eventually ill-fated guy who, uh, well, you know about the dictatorship in Chile, which incidentally, you know the Chicago people were the main economic advisors. Uh, initially, you got very glowing support for reports, and to a degree in a developing country, there was some justification because they had very little private capital market at all, not a problem we have in the United States. But in time, it became obvious that there were terrible problems. <coughs> and we read about England, for instance. Uh, when you have quite a bit of money, you get a stockbroker who treats you well, gives you fairly low fees and so forth, and you have enough money to buy a whole range of stocks and, and spread the risk. If you have as little money as most of the people would have who are thrown out of social security, uh, they take advantage of you. You can read any number of stories, many of them from England, uh, about giving advice. I, I, matter of fact, in our own family, I mentioned, I think, my sister and brother-in-law who respectively are in literature and history, and really they wouldn't mind if I tell you that they don't know anything about finances. And they talked to my husband, for whom it was a hobby, and he looked into this, and it was quite clear that their stockbroker was maximizing transactions, not income, because the stockbroker is paid by transaction, whether you win or lose. Well, that sort of thing is bound to go on when, when you have small investment. Also, there are two other reforms that could be introduced, though I will admit they're controversial. And I have never pretended that my suggestions are free of value judgments. On the contrary, I use my best value judgments and divulge what it is. One of the <coughs> uh, problems is that uh, when uh, well, I would lost my train of thought, uh, when uh, you uh, when. Yeah, one of the problems is that people at the higher level, we only tax them up to a point for Social Security and beyond. There is no reason in the world, if you believe that a more equal income distribution would be most salutary, surely it doesn't take any convincing to make you realize that an additional $1,000 or $10,000 or whatever it is income to someone who already earns a million a year doesn't mean very much. 
whereas it would mean the difference between starving and not starving for people at the beginning, at, at the lower end. So this is something that could easily be remedied by abolishing the cap. The other thing you could do, and this one is even more controversial, is <coughs> that a married couple, either the man has double deductions for Social Security or whatever higher proportion for the wife, and then they have more income, or alternatively, if only he pays in, only he gets Social Security. Now people say, how can you do that? What would she live on? But if you take a job, does your employer say, do you have a wife who's not employed? I pay you double. No, he says, you're getting this much, and if the family decides they can't live on it, then she has to take a job. That's the way capitalism works. Uh, but when you suggest it for Social Security, people are outraged. Uh, I definitely would want to mention that I do not think any such change should ever be made retroactive. People who for the last 10 or 15 or 40 years or whatever it is worked on the assumption that this is the system they're operating under, it would be totally unreasonable to suddenly say we are changing. But looking ahead, I would make the change from now on and if you can't afford to live on one income, then you better see to it that you have two incomes. And I have always been convinced that there is much more to a job or career for the woman than just the additional income. I, it, it's your whole life. And it's not only that people point out the divorce rate is so high that you had better think about that. I was very lucky. I was very happily married for 35 years. But what in the world would I have done for the rest of my life? I would have never met any of you people here. I wouldn't have had the money to come here for that matter. Um, but all my friends, and I, I can't imagine what I would do if I didn't have my research and so forth. So I, I was telling someone the other day that in case they had questions about what the difference is between work and leisure, that I can tell them exactly. I do exactly now what I did when I was employed, except for teaching. But then I was paid, so it was work. But now I'm not paid, so it's leisure. <laughs> but quite seriously, I think living only through your husband's job is sort of a second-hand way of living. I've known widows who it turns out when their husband died, even their friends were their husband's colleagues' wives, with whom they often didn't have much in common. It's, it's just not a reasonable way to live. And as far as children are concerned, my children were so pleased when I got the heck out of the house part of the day, and when they could go to nursery school, and we really enjoyed each other then for the few hours that were left. You know, they are diminishing marginal returns to all these <laughs> So, so much for that. Uh, the other research, which is really quite different, uh, there has been some work done over some years now, uh, which shows that it makes a difference how much political influence women have. One of these studies looked at uh, American policy after women got the vote. And another, and I think these people were really ingenious to take advantage of that, did a study of Switzerland, which was always called the greatest democracy in the world, but women didn't get the vote until a relatively few years ago. And they looked at Switzerland, their budgets before and after women got the vote. And lo and behold, the evidence indicated that there's considerably more expenditures on social programs and on education. But these people decided, they were neoclassical theorists, uh, that um, <clears throat> this was only because women had lower incomes. And so, of course, it was in their self-interest to have some redistribution of income. So when we did this work, first of all, we looked at all countries in the world, which had not been done before. And secondly, uh, 
uh, we looked at a couple of policies that are patently not self-serving for women. One is international aid. And it's a very statistically significant and significant in real terms, higher proportion of income when there are more women in the legislature or it's in parliaments as they call them in most of the high school world. The second one is the death penalty. Now it is well known that even in this country, which has really done all of the death penalty by the standards of almost all the rest of the world, you hardly ever execute a woman, so it could not be self-interest. And there is a very high relationship of either the death penalty being abolished entirely, or in a good many countries where it's still on the books but hasn't been used for decades. And so it seems to me what you're really finding is that women are somewhat more, on average. <laughs> Some people think I would vote for Sarah Palin because she's a woman, and I always point out that the whole point of feminism is that you judge people on their individual merit and not by their sex. But clearly, I think it is precisely because of the established division of labor that women are the ones who are expected to look after children and after elderly, the helpless, the needy and it makes them more aware of the importance of this. Whatever it is, we certainly found that there was a very definite difference. And in conclusion, I want to mention very briefly something we found in another paper I, we have been working on. Years ago, I did some research on how often male authors cite male authors and how often female authors cite male and female authors. And this is of substantial importance. Those of you on the faculty will find this comment entirely redundant, but some of you are still students. The be all and end all at research universities and increasingly even at colleges is not only that you publish, but how often your publications are cited. So this is very crucial. And given the absence of a better measure, it's not that unreasonable. But what I found years ago, that men were substantially more likely to cite men than women, and women were substantially more likely to cite women relative to how often they are cited by men. Now, in some fields, that's not that important if you have a roughly equal number of men and women. This is still far from true in economics, as I presume you're all aware of. So you're really at a disadvantage. And we, the new research was trying to update the research and see to what extent this has changed. And we not only found that it has changed some, and in the direction that one would hope of less difference. But what was really encouraging, and something that I should have thought of a priori, but did not, there are also papers and books, though we focused on papers, uh, that are co-authored by at least one man and at least one woman. And what really came up is that there was far more collaboration and of course, then you get a much better chance at more equal citations. And this harks back a bit to the work of Rosabeth Cantor, who was at Harvard, and maybe still is, who did a work on women in uh, executives, management, and found that they were in the worst position and there were so few that they were viewed as tokens. And this really, I think, can best be interpreted in those terms. That even in economics, and this work is entirely on economics, that even though women certainly don't comprise half of the profession, that they have gone beyond the point of tokens, and that they are now viewed as potential collaborators. And then also, the co 
fall off. And Harvey was so much more like the decay and they were citations. So I thought, since I've said a lot of negative things, it would be nice to end up with this positive note. Thank you. Thank you. say, have you considered the disadvantages as well as the advantages? And <coughs> those disadvantages are not there because I like them, but simply because they are. Uh, there are a lot of people where the man does not earn enough to support the standard of living that they both would very much like to achieve. <coughs> there are situations where the woman, who on average will earn less, even if she is in the labor market all the time, uh, has a more steady job 
You know, a nurse is not likely to be fired. An automobile worker who earns far more, or at least did until recently, um, is likely to be fired. And so forth, I would point out these things to them. I would also point out, I once was chair <coughs> of a national academy panel on the employer policies and working families. And because I was on that panel, they asked me to sit in on another panel which was specifically studying the impact of daycare for children as opposed to be taken care of at home. And as far as I can tell, this is not my view, but as far as I can tell, the people who were doing the papers were very competent and very thorough and didn't start out with a particular bias. And they found that, I'm sorry, I should walk up to the front. I didn't mean to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> that good daycare was considerably better than the average home. Now, poor daycare is terrible whether it's at home or elsewhere. The assumption that people tend to make who say the mommy should stay home and take care of the children is that they will have good daycare at home and that all other daycare. Uh, if you want to eat a view which is no more unbiased than mine, Barbara Bergman did, I think, a book, not just a paper, on the French uh, Ecole Maternelle. Incidentally, the irony is that they call it called Mutter now. Uh, but be that as it may, they are publicly financed and all of it's voted. Uh, and she came out with a very positive evaluation after going there, really studying and so on. Uh, <clears throat> people who kind of live with or without my personal approval in a capitalist economy, right? where people can afford things or they can't afford things. If people can afford to achieve what they consider an acceptable standard of living with only one member employed, I would point out some of the disadvantages, such as that it's not just the work, it's your contacts, it's cutting out of the house, etc., etc. Um, but if that's what they want to do, I'm not about to tell other people how they should lead their lives. I do not. I was raised in a family where no one ever heard of an employed mother. So it isn't that I think it's all that terrible. Though incidentally, my mother uh, had a maid to look after us much of the time. That's the way things were in Europe. But <coughs> I, I did not make men to make, I don't think, you know, that one to make derogatory remark. I think for most people it's an unwise judgment. That's my best opinion. Please join us for the reception downstairs, and thank you very much.